Hello everyone, it's Bradford Speaks, the host of the Everything Matters podcast. I've got a really special guest lined up for today's episode. His name is Bruce Sampson. Bruce is a great friend of mine. We both grew up in the same town. And although Bruce was several years older than I was, he left a remarkable and incredible legacy behind him. And I have the opportunity to really appreciate and celebrate Bruce for the contribution that he made to our hometown and the iconic example that he was to follow for guys that were in my age group. Bruce left our hometown after high school and has been on a track to make a remarkable reputation for himself in the areas of cultural arts. For more than two decades, Bruce has produced stage shows, camps, and special events all around the world, including some of the most iconic places in the United States like Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farms, and Tibby's Music Hall. He's developed curriculums for arts organizations and has co-directed show choirs both at the high school and intermediate school levels. He's also co-directed arts camps and had the opportunity to teach fine arts both at the high school and the collegiate level. He's recently moved back to the Louisiana area, his home state, and will be producing and presenting his Believe Camp to many youth organizations in the region. So please help me welcome Bruce Sampson, my friend, to the Everything Matters podcast. Let's get it popping. Bruce, man, so great to see you on the episode of Everything Matters podcast. We've been working on putting it together for a minute. So um, oh, thank you. <laughs> absolutely, man. And I thank just, I'm, I'm just, thank you for being here, man. I know you're a busy guy. You got lots going on and you took the time to be here. You're on the West Coast right now. So it's a little early for you. So, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. So thanks for being available and making yourself available to be on the show, man. Um, you know, I want to start out just letting people know the connection that we share. You know, um, sure. you know, a lot of people might not know, you know, people that know me might not know you. People that know you might not know me. Sure. You know, <laughs> you're you're several years older than I am. Uh, however, um, I came behind you and and you may not know this. You had a big impact on who I became in life. And and, um, mm-hmm. and it was really like a sort of a uh, I'd say an intermediary intermediary uh, mentor. You didn't know this <laughs> probably, wow. you know. No. So, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, really great, man. And, um, you know, growing up in this small town of Bogalusa, we all have our different experiences of what that's like, right? And, and, and me being a few years behind you, you know, your experiences m- might have been a little bit different than mine. So I want to give the yeah. audience a sense of knowing, you know, a little bit more about you, your experience, knowing you from the small town of Bogalusa, went on to California, did big things, and we're going to get into all of that. Um, but I want to just give people a sense of who you are, you know, what was your family life like? How'd you grow up? And, 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 uh, you know, just what it was like growing up there in that small town of boat. Yeah. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you, man. I'm, I'm honored to be here and I appreciate all of that. Um, I guess what I would, I would say is that, you know, small town country boy, uh, I grew up, um, outside city limits. I was an only child. My parents were both educators. Um, my mom taught English and history, uh, for, half her career and for the other half she was uh, a principal at an elementary school until she retired um mm. spent 41 years in education before she retired and my dad wow. uh taught what they referred to as special education uh in junior high got it so uh um, wow. i i i grew up kind of i always felt a little isolated uh because my parents were really protective and so uh, you know, pretty much and, uh, I was by myself out in the country, had a few cousins that lived around uh, that were m- my neighbors. And then uh, mm-hmm. uh, and then I went to a private school. I went to a Catholic school from kindergarten through eighth grade. So and it was relatively small and we had priests and nuns and the whole deal, you know, back in the day. You went to and, you went to Annunciation, right, Ruth? Annunciation, yeah, you went to Annunciation, yeah. right, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was an ultra that, boy. That, all that fact. stuff. I, yeah, okay. I did not know that, man. That's new news. Yeah. Great. Well, Great. well, here's a funny little thing about Annunciation is that um, um, I also was uh, brought up Catholic. Uh, my mom and I were Catholic, and um, okay. I was an altar boy 
you know, at the, at the church and everything. <laughs> and right? until, uh, I don't remember the age, but probably about 11 or 12, um, mm -hmm. I had it in my brain that I was going to be a priest, you know, for, uh, you okay. know, I was, I was wow. uh, cause, cause I had all the nuns around me and they kept saying, Oh, you'd be a great priest. And, you know, so <laughs> I was like, okay, well, that makes right. sense. You know, okay, great. You know? And then, uh, we right. went away to this, uh, <laughs> we went away to this retreat at an abbey, uh, somewhere in Mississippi. And, okay. um, uh, this, uh, I don't remember what he was. I, I wanted to call him a monk because he, he was dressed like a monk. <laughs> but uh, right. <laughs> he came in to speak to us and stuff, and he talked about the life of a priest and everything. And that, and he somehow mentioned something about you know, um, you know, in the Catholic Church, you know, you're not allowed to marry and whatever. So all of a sudden, it clicked in my mm -hmm. brain. I'm like, wait, no girls? <laughs> and that was the first time that that hit my brain. Like, I'm out. <laughs> and I'm, I'm out. like, yeah, I'm out. <laughs> Instantly, I was that's out. Hilarious. That's, <laughs> that's hilarious, man. You know, it makes you wonder how many young boys and maybe even young girls, you know, uh, had that experience, right? It's like, oh, yeah, I want to be yeah. a nun. I want to be. And then you realize, wait a minute, I can't I can't have boys and girls? No, nah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> that's Literally, really that cool, was man. the moment. <laughs> really cool. That's, that's yeah. awesome, man. So you grew up in what we would call... You know, and and not to say that Bogalusa is the city by any stretch, right? You grew up in the country, like outside oh, yeah. the city limits, like so you big yard. Yeah. I'm guessing you know, uh, you maybe have a couple of cows yeah. running around, goats, what have you, right? So <laughs> you certainly grew up in the country, man, and and we weren't far from you. You're probably five minutes outside the city limits, so it wasn't like we right. was, you know, again, city by any stretch. Uh, but that's really cool, man, and and also I our parents are both educators. You know, my mother taught the right. school system, and I know that our parents know each other. Um, mm -hmm taught in the school system for 30, 34 years too. So, you know, people yeah. then, and I, and I sort of look at you as similar to that generation where you went into investing and really giving back to, to, to the youth too. And, uh, you know, so there was something there that inspired you, I would say, uh, and assert that, uh, that there's something you saw there when you were young that you said, man, I want to, I want to kind of be in this, this area too. So, you know, when you watched yeah. your parents doing what they did in education, Right. How did you determine or decide what you wanted to do next after you finished at Bogalusa High School? You know, again, I remember coming to the extravaganza. I remember coming to all the concerts that, you know, Barbara Butler was having, you know, at the end. I mean, y'all just put on oh, mad yeah. shows. And it was like, you know, I, like I told you earlier, dude, you were someone, everybody, like you had that baritone, that bass, man. Everybody's like, man, Bruce Sampson singing tonight, man, Bruce Sampson singing tonight. And you know, <laughs> he was a he was a he was a star in Bogue. <laughs> so wow. you know, I, I told you earlier, I was telling you off I was telling you off camera, hey, dude, I mean, like me and my boys, we still talk about you. We still talk about Charles Bickham. Wow. And, and you got Tim Thompson, you know, guys that came before us, man, that that really yeah. trailblazed that for us. Like, you know, because you guys made it cool to be in the course, man. Like it was cool in Bogalusa mm. to be in the course. Right. You know, and right. and that was, you know, it like most of it was guys that were playing ball. If you weren't playing ball, like it was like, bro, nah, I'm playing football or basketball. I don't want nobody thinking yeah. no funny stuff about me, right? But like y'all right. made it cool to be in course, man. And I appreciate you for being that trailblazer. So how did you end up getting into it? You said something earlier about being a, 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 a um, an only child. And I know sometimes being an only child, yeah. you have to find ways to entertain yourself in a way, right? So yeah, what was your biggest influence, you know, and inspiration for, choosing to go into the arts and, and let's just back it up a little bit when you were at Bogalusa high school or maybe in middle school when did you realize that being in the arts as a career and as a life was the direction that you wanted to go in oh it was re really early in, in fact I'll tell you um mm -hmm. I, I can't remember a time when the arts weren't a major part of my life my dad in addition to being mm -hmm. a teacher was also a musician so he played for a lot of uh, local churches um both in Louisiana and Mississippi. And so we had a piano and we had an organ in the house. And so there was always music around. Nice. And my dad had a collection of, of jazz. Like he had everything, you know, like he had jazz, he had Frank wow. Sinatra, you know, like all this stuff. So I grew up listening to all that, you know, and just mm. loved it. And so I think that that was probably my first influence. But I think the moment when I knew for myself that this is something I can do, and start aspiring to as, as a young person was actually watching the Ed Sullivan show for those who remember uh, the Ed Sullivan show back in the day. Mm, yeah. Um, when the Jackson you're, Five you're made like their first. 
Yeah, I'm a little before you, yeah. <laughs> but it used to be like this night, um, I don't know if, I, if it was a weekly or a nightly um, television variety show. And he would just bring on all these different artists, you know, of the day that were popular. And sometimes he'd introduce new artists. And so for me, um, it was when he introduced the Jackson Five, Michael Jackson and mm-hmm. his brothers for the first yeah, time. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I, I remember like it was yesterday, I was in the kitchen, I was making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. My folks were in the den <laughs> watching the TV, watching Ed Sullivan, and they were like, get in here, get in here, there's some little boys on TV. And I was like, what? Mm-hmm. And so I came in and sat down and I was hooked. I, because that was the first time in my brain, because remember, I'm I'm listening to music like Frank Sinatra, um, uh, right. Billy Eckstein, Nat King Cole, those guys. Right. And so I'm thinking, well, that's way, way off for me. You know, that one day when I'm older, when I'm an old man, mm-hmm. then maybe I can do right. that stuff. All of a sudden, there were these young kids in front of me singing and dancing. I'm like, wait, <laughs> you mean I can do this? Now? This is a career? <laughs> so that right. was it, man. That was the switch. And from then on, I was Ooh. I was determined initially to be um, a recording artist. Yeah, that was, that mm-hmm. was my initial dream. Bruce, man, amazing story. I mean, I never, first of all, I didn't know you went to Annunciation. And then <laughs> secondly, you know, the people that you watched on TV and the Jackson 5 inspired you. Really amazing, man. Oh, so yeah. you decided at that point that, hey, you know, I could do this. I don't have to wait till I'm 50, 60 years old. I could do this now. There's <laughs> kids that are like eight, nine doing this. They look like me, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so you go through school, you finish up at Annunciation. I guess you go to middle school, maybe at Annunciation or either Bogus Junior mm-hmm. High School. And then you go to high school. So going through high school, I know for a fact, because I watched you, like I said earlier, you being in the course. So when you were in the Bogles High School course, I know Miss Butler, Barbara Conrad Butler, God rest her soul, uh, was a major influence on you as well as she was on me and so many other students that came through her programs. So talk yeah. about when you were in her course and, you know, and the, the impact and influence that she had on you and who you became as an artist. Oh, yeah. So for me, I was aware of uh, Miss Butler before going to school, you know, uh, because, you know, every year when they have the Christmas concerts and spring concerts, right. my parents yes. would take me to those, you know. And so to me, that like that was that was the big time, you know, <laughs> that's no what doubt. it felt no like when I was a kid. And so um, I was in the station, like I said, you know, kind of sheltered and, um, to, you know, to some degree through eighth grade. So in ninth grade, that's when I went to Bogus High School, joined the choir. There was never a question I was going to, you know, audition and join the choir. And I I felt like, well, I'll say this. I, I always kind of felt like a little bit of a nerd and an outsider because of, I didn't live in the city, in the neighborhoods, you know, with my right. peers and stuff, you know. So I felt like a little bit of an outsider. Plus, my parents were teachers, so there was, and I'm sure you can relate to this to some degree. So I had <laughs> friends who were like, "Yeah, your mama's mean, man," and you know, <laughs> you know, you know that whole yeah, thing. <laughs> totally, you know, totally, man. I, um, yeah, I, was, I my, my friends, man. When my friends would come to the house, I, I, I just stopped bringing my friends to the house, man. I just I just stopped because I'm like, you know what? But the, what was weird about it though, Bruce? Like, they love my mom so much, she didn't occur to them as mean. Like, man, that's just oh, okay. your mama, dog. That's how she is. You know? But to me, I was like, man, my mom mean, bro. You yeah, know, yeah. Like, same, same. But she, you know, <laughs> but she didn't she didn't play. Uh, so I'm totally with you on that, man. Oh, Our yeah. mother did not play. Back then, you couldn't play. Yeah, they didn't play. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, but yeah, but the choir felt like, it felt like home to me. Like, all of a sudden, I found my people. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. of that love of music yeah. and all of that, that creativity. And then you had Miss Butler, who also didn't play. You know, she had a philosophy of no one monkey Facts. stops the show, you know, and That's so right. <laughs> she always kept us with a level head, too. So you didn't get to that point of like, oh, I'm all that, you know, or whatever. Because right. she would tell you in a heartbeat, you know, if you had a solo or something and you started <laughs> acting up, bloop, night of the show. Sorry. You out of here. <laughs> you know, <That's> right. <laughs> and That's that was right. it. She also taught me some um, some practices that I still carry today in terms of punctuality. You know, being a man and being on time because she would right. say, you know, look, we publish in the newspaper and we let everybody know it's on their ticket. The show starts at 7 p.m., 7 p.m. downbeat. I don't care if, you know, two people are in the audience and mama misses your solo and stuff. You saw what time it was. 
you know, because we right. start on time. That's right. You know, so I learned so much there. And like I said, it, it felt like family. And that's where I met, you know, some of my my dearest friends, you know, uh, through the course. But that's where yeah. I started to figure out who Bruce was, you know, um, Got it. you know, all that sort of thing. That's cool, man. So cool. So <clears throat> so you find home. You know, you and you, and you do yeah. your four years at BHS, and and again, you make your mark there. You left a lot of history behind you. What happens next for Bruce? You leave Bogus High School, and then what? So immediately, I actually went to Loyola University in New Orleans. Uh, Ms. Okay. Butler took me over there during my uh, senior year and had me audition for the Master Corral, and so they gave me a scholarship mm. uh, to. Uh, and this is a funny story too. Uh, uh, to you know, to be in the choir and everything, and so I uh-huh. I went to Loyola, uh, stayed on campus. You know, it's part of the Master Chorale and a couple of other choirs that they had. And mm-hmm. uh, all mm-hmm. the, one day they called me down to the office, um, to the guidance office or, or whatever it was called then, and mm-hmm. started. They said we're looking at your your schedule and you aren't taking enough music classes. I was like, excuse me, and they're like. <laughs> yeah, you're 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 taking choir, but you're not taking the other classes that a normal music major would take. I said, "Oh, well, that's the that's mm. the thing. I'm not a, I don't want to be a music major. I want to be a mass communications major." And they said, oh. "Well, <laughs> the scholarship is dependent on you being a music major." You know, and I went, "Oh, oh well, you can have the scholarship oh. then because I'm not <laughs> because in, that's not my in, thing." <laughs> yeah, I, and I thought it was really funny because I, I equated it to like getting a football scholarship, right? That right, we're paying right. you to come play, you know, we're we're paying for your education so you can come play football for us. So I was like, oh, you're paying right. for me to come sing in your choir. <laughs> you know, so that's what I thought. <laughs> oh my God, that's funny. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Crazy. And so that, uh, yeah, because in my mind, and to this day, a lot of people assume that I majored in music, but I didn't. I majored in uh I ended up majoring in print journalism with a minor okay. in English. So that's what my Got degree it. is in. But um, my whole thought process was, I was trying to think practically of like, music comes naturally to me. Like I play by ear, I can also read music and all of that. So my thought yeah. was, I need something to fall back on. So if that doesn't right. work for me for a minute until then, I need something else. Right. And I loved English and I loved you know communication and radio and all of that. And in high school, I worked in radio. I worked at the lo- local radio stations. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so that was the direction I went in. <laughs> that's, that's awesome, man. You know, I, I found out we still have more in common. Uh, I was also a journalism major. And, uh, okay. uh, you know, mine was in television broadcasting and, and uh, with a minor in English as well. So always love okay. to write. Always, and maybe that goes back to being teacher's kid, right? And who knows? Right. They just made us. <laughs> we loved all that stuff. Um, yeah. Man, that's a great story. Great story. So. So you decide, you realize that, man, this ain't really okay. Uh, take the scholarship. I, I, I just want to, do, you know, that's, that's not the kind of music I want to do. I want to do mass comm. Right. So then what happens next? Where do you go to, to, to continue to, to chase that? Well, so while I'm still there, I ended up, uh, like some young men are, want to do, um, I, mm-hmm. I met this beautiful young lady at, at Oh, Loyola no, Bruce. I, that, are man, you going there? Come on. Yeah, oh, you got caught man. up. <laughs> yep. I man, I fell in love. It was it was it was it. Uh, um, I know, man. But this young lady actually ended up changing my life though, because mm. um we we ended up dating, you know, like okay. and and she made me work hard. <laughs> but okay. we yeah, um, we ended up dating <laughs> and she you know, so you know, so I was writing songs and stuff and I would we go over to the music building and I'd play songs for her and stuff. And she's like, wow, you're so good. I love your music and all of this. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so she said, I want to have somebody I want you to meet. So she, she said that we have this family friend who owns um, a record label in New Orleans and a okay. uh, recording studio. And it was Rosemont Records. And they okay. mostly did um, gospel and uh, jazz, I think, back in the day. Makes sense. But they were starting to get into pop and funk and R and B and stuff. They, they were starting to try to get into that. So she takes me to uh, to meet the guy who owns both the studio and the record label, 
And so he said, okay, sit down and play something for me. So I sat at the grand piano in the studio and I played a couple of songs. He said, play something else. And I just kept playing. He goes, how many songs have you written? And I was like, <laughs> hundreds, you know, like, <laughs> so I was like, wow. I write a couple of songs a day, you know, like right, right. Um, back then, that's what I, you know, that's what I did. And so right then on the spot, he said, I want to sign you to a deal. And so I ended up signing with Rosemont Records. I okay. put out an EP, just two songs. Uh, oh, man. Can I find that on Spotify? Is that, can I find it on Apple Music? Is it available? Uh, uh, not yet, but it will be. It's, <laughs> th- right. That's a whole nother story. <laughs> okay. Um, it's it's kind of had a resurgence. It's come back. Um, I actually okay. just signed okay. a new deal, and I'll, I'll tell you about that later. But um, Okay. But cool. yeah, but I ended up um, recording that record um, at the end of my first, uh, my freshman year in, uh, in college. Gotcha. And during the summer, uh, and I guess I kind of skipped over a part of my life, but my introduction to the young Americans. So mm-hmm. that actually happened when I was in high school. And okay. for those who don't know, the young Americans is a group that's been around since 1962. They're a nonprofit, uh, performance group. And, they were actually the first, like, if you know what show choir is, they were the original show choir in America. So they were the wow. first ones to take off the robes, you know, dance and, and add choreography and, and theatrics to their performances. And so uh, awesome. when I was 15, I had the opportunity to go up and spend a summer with them in Northern Michigan at their summer home. And I was part of several productions and, and was asked to join the group at 15. And uh, in order to be in the group, you had to relocate to Southern California, which was their main base uh, mm. for all of your training and for you know putting right. the shows together and all of that, because they would also tour and uh, do concerts and albums and stuff. And I knew them because they used to be, um, there'd be like these holiday Christmas shows and stuff like uh, Johnny Mathis. And, you know, he'd have a special, you know, that would come on right. and it would say featuring the young Americans, you know? And so I'd seen yeah. them before. So I knew who they were uh-huh. from television. And, um, so anyway, so I had that opportunity that, that summer and I was like, well, I knew my parents weren't going to let me go to California. So, uh, at 15. So right. I went, well, that was a nice experience. Goodbye, young American. Right. You know, but I learned a lot, <laughs> right. you know? Um, right. so now fast forward to, I'm in the studio recording, my record in New Orleans Mm -hmm. and I get a call from young Americans saying, Hey, we have this dinner theater in Northern Michigan. And we remember that you were a really good bass and we need a, we need a bass. Uh, Mm -hmm. Cast is already up there. They've already started rehearsing and everything, but we'd love to fly you up and and have you join them and give you a crash course. You learn the show really quick and we'll throw you in. And so I turned to my manager and I said, let me go do this because I know that once my record comes out, I'm going to have to go do a lot of public appearances. And I hadn't really been dancing because in choir, we didn't really dance that much, you know? And so I thought this will be a great experience for me to, you know, get my chops back up as far as movement and choreography Mm -hmm. and get Mm -hmm. some ideas about production. So uh, he thought it was a great idea. He said, yeah, go do that. We'll finish up the record. So once I recorded my parts, um, I left and went to Michigan. And then he and uh, the other producers pulled together and, and finished off the record for me. Okay. And while I was in Michigan, they sent a copy of the record to me. Uh, or they sent gotcha. me a box of records. And um, so I'm up there performing with the Young Americans. And it became um, kind of just a regular thing that every night at the end of the show, it was... Uh, kind of an intimate setting. So we, you know, we only had about 100 to 150 people in the audience mm-hmm. and they were all having dinner and stuff, you know, so the tables were really close to the stage. And so it was a really intimate uh, atmosphere. And at the end right. of the night, we, we take questions. So we, you know, we all sit across the stage and say, do you guys have any questions for any of us? You know, mm-hmm. whatever. Every single night. Uh, well, first of all, we introduce ourselves and say who we were, where we were from and something that the audience might not know about us. So I'd always mention my record. I'm excited to get home. My record is out and you know right. whatever. Right. And so every single night, someone would say, we want to hear one of your songs, you know? And so, <laughs> of course, of course. And so I'm like, okay. So I walk over to the band pit, you know, and I sit down at the piano and I sing, 
the ballad on there, which is called Stay Be My Lady. And so I sing that, you know, play that or whatever, just a little bit of it. And every night people would come up and say, can we buy your record? And I just happened to have a case of them. So I was like, so that was my little side hustle. Take a little hustle, right? I was yeah, selling right, records. Right. I'm like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> now, how, now, how's your record label getting the royalties back? I'm going to get you in trouble right here. How'd they um, get the royalties? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and what's really funny is that I didn't even understand all that stuff. Like, you know what oh, I mean? Sure, so, yeah, exactly. So I'm just like, you well, you sent me records. I, I guess you want me to do something with them. So right. I can <laughs> only play one at a time. time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. great, man. Really great. So, yeah. So that was my reintroduction to the Young Americans. And um, then I, like I said, I finished that summer, came back to Louisiana, to New Orleans, and we started performing, just started doing gigs at clubs, universities. Um, I remember doing something down in the French Quarter where they, uh, mm -hmm. I think it was for Halloween, they had a big, um, you know, stage set up in the middle of the street and right. and I was the headliner and did a whole thing. I opened for Cool in the Gang once out in City Park, you know, some different things like that. Wow. Big acts, man. Um, it's big acts to follow. Yeah. Yeah. Or I guess to precede, I guess, if you open it up. <laughs> But it was kind That's of funny, great. though, because that career, um, I wasn't happy, though. And a lot of it had to do with the people I was surrounded with were all much older. So like my backup band, these guys were way older than me and they were into heavier stuff that I was into. And they were into some stuff that I just it just wasn't me. And Got so it. I just wasn't comfortable, wasn't happy in that environment. And so I literally went to my manager and said, you know, I, I, I really would like out of my contract. And I had a three year deal with him. And to wow. his credit, he let me out of it. He's like, well, you know, really? He said, if you're, if you're not happy, you know, yeah. So he was, he was nice. a really good guy. Cause that doesn't usually happen in the business, you know? No, um, no. But he was kind enough to let me out of my contract. And as soon as that happened, I got another call from young Americans saying that we're opening mm -hmm. a full-time dinner theater in Atlanta, Georgia. And they asked me if I'd like to do it. And at that moment, I wasn't in school. Record deal's gone. Perfect time. Perfect. Yeah. Like, I'm there. And wow. so I did that for a few years. So I was back with the Young Americans again performing. I keep learning different new things about you every every time <laughs> we just we keep going here. The more we talk. I didn't know you lived in Atlanta for a period of time. My knowledge of you is like Bruce has always been in Southern California. So... I know that's been a mm. big chunk of your life in Southern California, but you came to Atlanta and you were here for from 82 to 86. Is that right? Right. Right. On that time frame. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So you took the gig with, um, with young Americans as a full time, I guess, working for them full time. So what, what did you do? Like, what did that entail being a full time, you know, cast member for young Americans? Well, we had this dinner theater and it was comprised of, uh, mostly alumni. So the way it was designed was in the actual big group, the young Americans, the age range was 15 to 21. And then at 21, okay. you basically were like, bye-bye, you know, <laughs> go on and, and live uh, your life. But they did have right. uh, a few projects that were called uh, these Young American Dinner Theaters around the country. And they'd open this new one in Atlanta, and they asked me to be a part of it. Now, I wasn't 21 yet. I, I was only 19 at that point. But, um, mm. but they were like, yeah, we like you. You're a good fit. You know, go, you know, go do it. And like I said, it was perfect timing wow. for my life. At, at that point. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so we performed, we actually, it was one of the situations where we waited on tables and then we okay. would do a show after dinner, you know, and it was kind of oh, an interactive okay. experience. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, and what was really special for me was, uh, I got the opportunity. That was kind of the first time that I started getting opportunities to write segments mm. of the show and come up with ideas. Oh, nice. So the director would turn and say, Hey, we want to do, and, and my first opportunity was something with the Jacksons. So he said, we're going to do this thing. And I was thinking about doing something with Michael Jackson or Jackson five or something. He goes, you have any ideas? And I okay. go, Oh yeah, I got you. You know, I, got so, <laughs> I know exactly what to do, you know? So um, I've been living for this moment. You have no yeah. idea. This is like, I've been, yeah. that's awesome. Exactly. Man. So that yeah, awesome. so that was kind of the beginning of me writing and directing, um, that's cool. Or, you know, stage productions and stuff was uh, in Atlanta doing that. 
And I also, during that time, met some of my dearest, dearest friends, including one, uh, Kenny Morris, who turns out later years, uh, we ended up forming a boy band later in California. But I found out years after all that, that he was actually the direct descendant of both Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. And so, wow. so that was a okay. whole thing, you know, a, that was a revelation wow. and stuff. But, but I made some really, uh, really cool friends and learned a lot. Some of the people I performed Sounds with like went on to Broadway and, and did a lot of different things. And so I was able to be a sponge, you know, and just grab all that stuff from everybody, you know. So you were in Atlanta for about four years and you moved to Southern California. And I recall you saying earlier that young Americans were based in Southern California. Uh, you found it out when you were in, in high school and you knew your parents wanted you go to California. So you had to say, OK, <laughs> bye, guys. But now yeah. <laughs> you're your 20s. You know, you have some more control of your destiny at this point. And right. so you had the opportunity to go to California. So I'm guessing that that's what caused you to end up going to Southern California. You continue your work with the Young Americans organization. So were you still working in the dinner theaters out there, still doing sort of the same thing? And if so, how long did you continue to do that? Yeah, it, exactly. Um, that's exactly what I was doing. The Young Americans had several dinner theater properties, and one of them um, was in Newport Beach, California. And so um, once I finished in Atlanta, um, the closing of that theater, they ended up closing that theater because the company that owned it decided mm -hmm. to sell the property. And so once that happened, around the same time, my father passed away. And so mm -hmm. I went home for a year to be with my mom and help her through the transition and all of that. And then I got a call from the young American saying, Hey, we got a job out here if you want to come out here. And so <laughs> my timing's about right. That works, you know? So I, yeah. I moved to uh, Southern California and worked at a couple of their dinner theaters where I continued performing, but I also started getting more opportunities to write and direct. And write, yeah. directing, writing and directing has obviously been calling you this whole time, right? It's everywhere you go, you got these opportunities yeah. that come up to be able to write and direct. And, and, and that obviously is yeah. what ended, you know, ended, what actually pushed you towards uh, creating your own organization, the Believe Performing Arts Experience that you currently run. So right. out in California, right, living in Southern California, I lived in Southern California, so I know how beautiful it is. And being in your <laughs> 20s. There's a lot of beautiful women out there. And I know you met one of them and you actually took one up and wife one up while you're out there. So yes, talk sir. about, you know, what, you know, <laughs> you know, you met your, you met your beautiful wife, you had three beautiful daughters. You know, I've seen pictures of them on social media and I mean, you got a gorgeous family, Thank man. You. So how did you two meet and how did you end up forming this beautiful union? Okay. So I, like I said, I was doing the dinner theater for uh, a few years with young Americans. Mm -hmm. And then another one of those transitions happened where, the the young Americans moved on to a different property, but they still had uh, these other dinner theaters. And so um, at that time, I was offered an opportunity to stay uh, with the restaurant company as they were bringing in new producers. And so I they offered me more money and, and some new opportunities and stuff. So I did that. And at that point, um, some new people who weren't, you know, young Americans, like now it's, they're just open call auditions from folks from all over LA and everything. And so this young lady came in and uh, joined our cast. And at, at first I didn't like her very much. <laughs> uh, I thought, well, she's a little Imagine cocky. I don't, I, don't, I don't know about her. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, totally uh, got it. Yep. but we became friends. Uh, we were friends for a really long time. We were actually the type we were the type of friends that would go to each other to complain about our significant others, like who we were dating <laughs> at the time. You yeah, know? yeah. And then we finally realized, wait, what are we doing? Like, <laughs> right. Forget them. Oh, we complain about them. Why don't we get together? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Duh. So, so that's basically that's cool. what happened. That's cool. So we met performing. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> so she's in the same, did she continue to work in the performance space? Y'all work together? And did you, did you create your, your company together? Um, yeah, I actually started a, um, a production company with another friend uh, called Busy Bee Productions that we produce okay. shows for like for Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm, different convention shows and things like that. Gotcha. And she worked alongside when she was an incredible piano player. And so um, she would help with some of the arrangements and and playing for the mm -hmm. shows and the band and, and, and all of that. 
So we continue to work together in, in that capacity. Yeah. That's sure. awesome, man. Awesome. And I'm guessing yeah. she's a, is she a California girl? She's from born and raised in California. Yeah. From Anaheim, okay. California, right down the street okay. from Disney. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. I very yeah. familiar. We lived in uh, Fullerton out there. So it's like 15 oh, minutes yeah. from Anaheim. So <laughs> went to Disney, yeah. Disney several times, man. It's awesome to know that you actually produce some of those shows and stuff that, that we see in those types of uh, venues, man. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. It, it was awesome. Um, my actually, my wife was actually um, she would go on to teach later, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, she got a degree, went back to school, got a degree and everything, and she actually taught in Fullerton for a while. Um, oh wow! In one okay. of the middle schools in Fullerton, yeah. I don't want to step over something that you mentioned earlier, and that was losing your dad. You know, you lost your dad. It sounds like in your early to mid twenties. It sounds yeah, like it was around, around 20, the time. Yeah. And I know that losing a parent is not easy. I also lost my dad in my in my uh, my early twenties as well. I was twenty four. Uh, so, you know, and, and, and kudos to you for going back and supporting your mom for that year, because I know she really appreciated having you there to just to just hold her up and let her know that she has some support. Um, yeah. So what was it like for you? And, and, and talk about some of the, you know, the, some of the challenges that you face in losing your dad, because obviously he's a, he's a uh, was a big impact in your life. I and mean, he's the one that called you in front of the TV and said, hey, Bruce, come watch the, these young kids on TV. And that was a big <laughs> inspiration for you, a big kind of a pivotal moment in your life. So what was it like for you yeah. losing your pops and how have you been able to, you know, to move through that? I mean, I know it's been a while, but, you know, how did you move through it then and how have you continued to to move through and how has he continued to be an inspiration for you, even his not even in his passing? Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that, that's kind of deep because some of that some of that I'm really just discovering now um, mm. the impact that he's had on me, you know, like it's really yeah taking hold hold right now. At the time, um, it was actually a shock. Um because my dad had been suffering uh, with leukemia uh, for mm. years, but he held it back from me. He never told me. Uh, he, wow. he knew I was pursuing my life and he didn't want to interrupt that because I think he knew that if I knew, I'd go back home and be with him. And he's like, no, yeah. I want you to go do your thing, you know? So right, right. Um, I found out mm. at the very end, just in enough time to go and spend the last two days with him, you know? Uh, mm. So I was with him holding his hand when he passed. And obviously that was, oh, it, that was, an, that yeah. was an incredible experience. I remember yeah. taking his, um, for his funeral, I ended up singing and playing the piano <clears throat> at his funeral. And mm -hmm. the only reason I had the strength to do that was actually because he had done it for his father mm. when his father passed away. So I remember my grandfather wow. passed away. I remember watching my dad going, man, how do you have the intestinal fortitude to get through that, right? you know, and to be Seriously. able to do that. And so when he passed away, I went, well, I have no choice. I've, I've got to do that. He did it for his father. I'm doing it for mine, you know? And right. so I did, you know, and I got through it and was trying to be strong for mom and all of that, but it was really rough. And I, I didn't know what life would look like, you know, without him. Yeah. So right. as much as I was there for my mom, I was also there trying to figure out, well, now I'm the man. So what, like, what is, what is that? Yeah, you know, so I went from this, <laughs> this thing of being, <laughs> yeah. living this selfish life. that's all about me, you know, and self first, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to, well, now I have to be concerned about a bigger picture and looking out for my mom and, you know, making sure she's okay along with still trying to pursue my dream and, you know, and all of that. But the thing wow. that I've discovered recently is uh, through my belief, program and some of the other things that I've done like the unity initiatives, mm -hmm. I've realized now that my dad was a bigger influence than I actually knew because um, what I've been doing is trying to use the belief to bring culture and the arts to underserved communities and to young people and to expose them to knowledge and to people and ideas that they might normally uh, not be afforded that opportunity. And so my dad, when he was an educator, used to do these annual trips where he would get two or three busloads of kids, some of which, you know, from Bogalus, like, like, you know, that there are a lot of kids, and I didn't understand this at the time, but there are a lot of kids who never leave the city, never leave Bogalus, you know, right. and you think, well, what about New Orleans? Like New Orleans is right there. It's an hour away. Right. Nope. Right. They never made it there. Right. And my dad knew that. Right there. And so he would take these trips and he would take them like to the Capitol building and let them 
see mm. that and understand what happens there. So then he'd take them to New Orleans and see the sights and sounds and stuff there. And back then, we had mm -hmm. a thing called Pontchartrain Beach, which was an amusement oh, park man. out on the beach. Love Pontchartrain Beach. Oh, yeah. yeah. And so that, that would be the culmination of everything was the kids got to go play and rides and yes. all of that stuff at Pontchartrain Beach. And so he did that every year. And he would also arrange for um, like breakfast for them and stuff. So back then we had, mm -hmm. I think it was called Tasty Donuts on Columbia Street. Yep. So he'd go uh -huh. by and pick up boxes of donuts for the kids. And then we had Stewart's nice. Dairy. Then he'd go and pick up milk cartons for all of them. Because yep. he also right. knew that there were some kids that the only way they got meals and got breakfast was at school, you know, through school right. meals and stuff. So he was doing that. Right. And it wasn't in, until recently that I've been able to connect those dots of, mm. oh, wait. So he was taking them to the culture and I'm bringing the culture to the kids. Wow. <laughs> I, I guess he was a bigger yeah. influence than I, than I realized, you know. So that's been kind that's of a, a recent, you know, aside from also just he and my mom both being teachers, you know, um, to yeah, be honest, for a yeah. long time, I was like, I'm not going to be a teacher. And my mom kept telling me, you're a teacher. You're a teacher. It's in you. <laughs> and I'm like, nope, it's in you. no, ma'am, no, ma'am. And sure it's enough, indeed. I'm like, she was right. I'm a teacher, you know? <laughs> yep. Yeah, they, they, they rarely miss, man. You know, and that's that's really interesting. Cause, you know, it's one of the things that I think we as parents, we we want for our kids to appreciate us and 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 see that at the end of the day, we only want what's best for them, you know? And I know that yeah. I didn't appreciate, you know, my mom and dad, I didn't appreciate what they were doing for me and and, and the, the stand that they had for my life. And, you know, about one, I didn't, I didn't get all that. I mean, I just wanted to go have fun and go run and run, run girls, play ball and do my thing, you know? <laughs> and it, right. it, it, it takes a, a level of maturity and we don't know when that might happen. And maybe in our thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, like who knows when it's going to happen, but something hopefully happens at some point in your life where you realize, man, my parents were, Dude, they really had a they they stood for me, man, it's in ways that I didn't even realize, right? And and the influence that they that they had on me is ongoing. It doesn't stop. You know, now I was like you, I didn't want to be a teacher either. And I and I didn't become a teacher. I went to New Orleans <laughs> and I after I finished college, I lived in New Orleans for about a year. Uh and I substituted in the fourth ward. And I got my life threatened a few times. I said, you know what? Mm. I'm good on that. I, I'm, this, this ain't the life I want. You know, but at 22, I'm thinking like that's that's how school is. And it's obviously not how all schools are. It's just right. in that community it was. Right. So, you know, really great, man. Thank you for sharing that with us so vulnerably. I, I know that losing a parent is, is, is something really tough to deal with. Um, so I want to talk about, you know, you 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 mentioned sort of the impact and the inspiration that that your your parents both had on you and you didn't think you're going to be a teacher you ended up being one anyway in in a lot of ways right you're you're teaching right. you're coaching you're developing you're writing all this stuff so the believe um it's called believe performing arts experience so you do these summer camps so how did how was believe formed like how did, what did that come out of what inspired that and 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 tell us how it's going right now okay so uh, this is another one of those young American transitions. So there was a period of time where young Americans kind of changed their mission um, to instead of just being a performing entertainment group and, you know, Goodwill Ambassador, that sort of thing, they shifted to doing outreach education using music. And so okay. they brought me back as a director. So for a number of years, I directed uh, groups of young Americans uh, all around the world. And so through the process of that, I started realizing how we were bringing people together and uh, using the arts to bring people together. And I thought about it and I had this epiphany of like, I thinking about my hometown and thinking how mm. divided it still was, you know? Uh, yeah. And this was, you know, 2014, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So I was thinking about that and I thought, you know, I want to, you know, Miss Butler was there, Coach Butler, all, the, all Coach McGee, you know, all these different people who had an right. impact and and gave, you know, um, when I was a youth, you know, are now, That's right. you know, some of them are gone now, right? Right. And so yep. I thought, oh, oops, tag, you're it, your turn, you know. So <laughs> I'm like, I need to go back and give back, you know. Right. And so I right. thought, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna put together a group of people, talented um, 
uh, and experienced folks who have also traveled the world and who I've worked with, mm -hmm. uh, who are now professionals in the industry, I'm going to get a bunch, get a group of them to go with me back to my hometown. Mm -hmm. I'm going to call this thing Believe. Okay. And it's going to be the, the theme of the, we ended up doing a, a five day camp uh, okay. where the kids come in for like, basically like school days, you know, from mm -hmm. yeah. morning till uh, late afternoon. And they take classes in singing, dancing, acting, and creativity. And through the process, what we're doing is teaching them a themed show that they then perform at the end of the week for the community. And so the first nice. year, the theme, uh, that first year, the theme was um, live, laugh, love. And so okay. it had different aspects about living, laughing, loving, and how people can come together. And so they did this, like I said, they did this production at the end. And my goal was just to do it one time. Uh, mm -hmm. So my plan was, I'm just going to do this once for my hometown. Right. Hope it inspires. The, 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 the goal behind it was embrace the possible, using the performing arts to educate, inspire, and unite. That was the whole thing behind it. But it was like, Love embrace it. the possible. You have to understand that you can do anything. Because I'm like, look at me, man. I'm from the same town. You know, had the same you know experiences and stuff that you're going through, right? And I've literally been around the world and done all these incredible things, you know, that I've been blessed yeah. to do. Uh, so anything is possible, you know, and letting that's them right. understand that. So that's where believe came from, and it organically started to grow because immediately people started talking, including my team that I brought. Were like, mm -hmm. okay, so next year we're going to do this and this, and they start having ideas. Oh, like, they start next carrying year, it. Like, what? Hold on. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't the plan. Like, that was not the plan. They're like, they're like yeah, we're, we're going to keep this thing going. And then uh, folks in Slidell heard about it and they were like, hey, we would like to invite you to come here and do it. Mm. Then I had another friend who was, I think they were originally from Bogalusa, but they moved to Mississippi and they were at a okay. school there. They invited us there. I had a gentleman that I met in, in California who um, was from China. Uh, that very okay. first year after I did the Bogalusa camp, he actually flew out and watched it and said, he said, oh, my goodness, the children of China need this. So he flew me to China and flew me to three different cities. And I worked with three different wow. schools and did a one one day, one man version of Believe in each of those wow. cities, just myself. And then a couple of years wow. later, we were able to bring the whole team out there and visit nice. uh, a number of schools and stuff. Yeah. Wow. Man, you've been around the globe inspiring people for 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 years. I mean, that's been your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's so awesome. And I want to acknowledge you for for even going back to Bogalusa. And, and Bruce, we also got to recognize that, you know, we grew up in the same town as a lot of these kids. But, man, the the, the, the city that they're growing up in, and I, I know you saw this when you were there, is very, very different than it was when we were there. I was talking to Absolutely. Bruce Plummer, which I think Bruce is a couple years younger than you are. Uh, I was talking to him a couple yeah. weeks ago, and he was talking about, you know, he said, man, this is Brad. He said, they, he said, man, I, he said, I'm, I'm doing my best to really be an inspiration for these kids, man. They just don't see anything for themselves. So I acknowledge you for, for investing. And, you know, when we look at our parents, right? Our, our parents went away to college and came right back to reinvest themselves and their lives literally yes. back into that community. And yeah. really, and I've had this conversation with many people over the years, really, that's what it takes. The reason that we had the experiences and we felt like we could actually do anything was because of what they invested in us. And it's a sacrifice because you go back to the small town. And, you know, for me, when I finished college, I'm like, I ain't going back to Bogalusa. What am I going to do? I don't want to work at the paper mill. Right. I don't, <laughs> right I don't, I'm right. not a school teacher. So you felt limited. So, man, again, I just acknowledge you for having the 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 wherewithal, the, the courage to go back into that city, man, mm -hmm. considering what's there. And, and try to make a difference, man. So thank you for, for contributing the way you have. It's awesome. Oh, bless you. Thank you. So Bruce, I want to talk briefly just about the Unity Initiative that you mentioned earlier. When you were talking about that, you know, I it took me di directly to this podcast, the Everything Matters podcast. It's one of the reasons I started the podcast. There's a few reasons. It's about performance, showing people that performance and everywhere in life is what makes a difference. You being in action about what you care about, what's important to you. The second thing that I wanted to do in this podcast is actually show people that conversations can be had, that conversations are actually what propel performance. Conversations can create the kind of world that we want to have. 
right? So in right. the arts, which is why I feel like in a lot of ways, I feel like the arts, because think about the way the arts were when you and I were in school. It's not the yeah. same now in, in most schools around the right. country, right? They right. took out the art. They gutted these schools of the arts. And I, I think, you know, and, I, you know, call me a conspiracy theorist. I think that they did that to create division so that people can't come together. Because when you think about arts and sports, those are two things that people come together from all cultures, all beliefs, all gender. It doesn't matter. People can come together and be judged just by what they bring to the table and what they're contributing. So right. you hit right on. You hit right home with me talking about unity. So talk about unity and, and your vision for that, creating these conversations that can bring people together. Yeah. So actually, it was kind of an extension of Believe because um, my target with Believe was working with kids, hoping that then that example and demonstration would then filter out to the adults in the community. And mm -hmm. what I started realizing was that um, the parents and the adults were actually putting the Believe experience and what the kids were going through in its own little box and saying that's mm. for that and that's in that moment right. and not a, really getting it and applying it to themselves. And so mm. I believing that, you know, we can just, if the, there's so much progress that we can make, like you're saying, you know, through having conversations, uh, I have people saying that, oh, you can't get along with these people. And oh, you can't go. I'm like, dude, I live it. Don't tell me it's not possible because right. I live it, you know? That's right. And so that's right. Um, so I had this idea and I started just having, went back home and I started having conversations. So I started inviting groups of people, uh, a diverse group of people, you know, and a lot of whom, which would never have a reason to interact with one another. And so we came together and we have these different exercises I put them through and we play some games and different things. Mm. And by the end, I come back and question and say, you know, well, what did you learn? And they would say, oh, you know, this guy over here, you know, he's into the same stuff I'm into. And I never would have known that, you know, and we right. had the same dreams and, oh, my kids did this too. And, you know, and there are all these areas where they were connected that previously they didn't believe was possible. There was no connection. And, right. and certainly the, those actually did exist. So through that process, they started to determine and to understand that. And so I've always believed that if we could just all... <laughs> you know, sit around a big table and, and have that, those types of conversations. Um, it's like, I heard someone say once, like, it's hard to hate somebody that you really get to know. Uh, I mean, and I believe that's true for most people. Now there's a few yeah. that yeah. <laughs> when you get to know them, yeah. like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but, exactly. But for the most part, generally, you know, yeah, I believe people, um, you know, are good at their core when they're, they're born. They aren't, they have to learn to hate. They have to learn right. to, you know, to exclude and, and, and all of those things. Right. And so, Indeed. Uh, so that's what unity was about. Unfortunately, kind of in the middle of all that starting the pandemic hit. And so I only mm -hmm. got a chance to do a few of those, uh, okay. uh, in person, sit down, let's have these conversations. So then I tried to use technology and say, okay, well, let's, let's do it virtually. Let's see if we can do it virtually. And I meant to do it mainly just for my hometown, but then other people around the country and and other countries joined in. Mm. And nice. so all of a sudden we were having this global conversation and which was even more profound because now it was like extended beyond the borders of the United States. And you had people right. in Germany and Japan and stuff who were saying, yeah, we experienced that too. Yeah, I can relate to that. And some of those people, just like I can believe, made friends and they're still communicating today you know, right. who never would have known each other because, you know, they're across the pond, you know? <laughs> so that's right. Um, that's right. So that's where unity came from. And that's what it was about. And it's something that I want to return to because I basically decided for myself that one, I'm an advocate for youth. So I, yes. I want to do everything I can to lift up youth because as I mentioned before, there, there was a whole generation before me that paved the way and opened those doors right. for me. And so it's, you know, tag, you're it. It's my turn. So I want to do as much of that as I can. And that's one of the things that's led me back to working with young Americans again, too, is the yeah. opportunity to help frame the next generation and and send them out into the world to do as much good yeah. as possible as well. Good stuff, Bruce. So I want to talk about real quick. Um, you know, I'm always inter interested to see how, how busy people manage it all. Right. Because people in, in terms of performance 
a lot of times people get stopped and they say, man, I just got too much going on. I'm too busy. My schedule's too busy. Obviously, you had a crazy, crazy busy schedule for many years. So talk about, you know, how you were able to manage all of that. You know, you've got three young girls you're raising at home. You've got a home that I'm sure you're taking care of there in California. You're flying here, flying there. You got to write. You got to direct. You got to all. You've got all this stuff going. And let's not forget, you got mama to keep happy too. So <laughs> how did you how did, how did you manage all of that, man? <laughs> well, I, I was extremely extremely blessed um, in that one. My wife uh, was an educator, so she had that stability of of working at a school and. Each of my girls went through that school. So she was keeping an eye on them from that standpoint, right? And then once they were old enough, all three of my girls actually joined the Young Americans. And so when they were nice. starting to uh, travel the world as well, I got to go with them. Like I was the director, That's awesome. you know, in many cases. So I got to have those experiences. So I was so blessed to get to work with Man. all three of my daughters beyond those high school years, you know, and, and to get Incredible. to see up close what they were experiencing, you know, and I knew their friends and, you know, like all, all of that. So yeah. it was, um, so in a way it, it was, it was all of that, but for, okay. but in those earlier years, I would say that, uh, I always joked that my kids were cursed because, um, <laughs> they grew up around performers, you know, I was always producing right. shows. So <laughs> right. I remember at a very, my my oldest daughter when she was born i remember having her on uh, her little bassinet thing on the stage rocking her with one hand playing the piano with the other teaching wow. you know as we were rehearsing and stuff so i was like <laughs> she was on stage from the get go you know from the beginning wow and now she's making a life as a performer you know so uh, really proud That's of awesome. her and and all three of my girls uh, my middle daughter is uh in atlanta now actually uh, she's going to school. Yeah, I think you told me that. Uh, yeah, and uh, pursuing her uh, her degree, and um, because all three of my kids put off college uh, so that they continue the world travels with the young Americans and all of that. Because each one of them came awesome. to me saying, "I guess it's time for me to go to school." And I'm like, "Look, this this is a moment in time where you have this opportunity. Take it because you can always go back to school. I'm living proof. You can go back later." So. So, so that's uh, so they all, you know, did that. And so now my middle daughter is in school. My oldest daughter is actually in China right now. She's at Shanghai Disney as a performer. She's about to move awesome, into um, another gig. <laughs> uh, so she constantly wow. moves around the world, you know, uh, uh, as a performer. She's been able to make a living and a life doing that. Met her husband that way. And uh, he's also a performer. Uh, my youngest daughter in Southern California and she had that teaching gene too. So she worked at a performing arts high mm. school for a while uh, teaching. Okay. And now we are um, actually working on a project right now where we uh, came back to write a, a show and direct a show for the young Americans for their summer camps. And she's my assistant director uh, for, for that wow. project. And she just got Man, a job at Disney. <laughs> so, nice. uh, Bro. Yeah. I mean, that's one way to do it. You know, I mean, like just keep them, just keep it all in the family, right? Keep them close yeah. to you. You raise them up in, in what you're doing. It's like, they don't got nowhere to go. It's like, you want to be yeah. with that? Yeah, go to the studio, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Yeah. I love that. That's one, that's a great way and, and, and good advice for other young parents out there who are, you know, wanting to, you're trying to figure out maybe how do I manage having a family, having a, you know, marriage, having a life, you know, get your kids involved in what you're doing. You know, it's something that I wish I'd done more of. I didn't do as much of because for whatever reason, it's no because, because whatever reason I just didn't, um, you know, so there are all my kids are in different directions, which is fine. I mean, like you said, they can, they'll yeah. figure it out, right? Like we, we'll all figure it out at some point, um, Absolutely. but there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. So man, thanks for sharing that. That's a really great story. Sure. Sure. Bruce, this has been a really fascinating interview, man. And, and I want to thank you for letting us in to your life and to your world. And I know that you're continuing to be busy. Uh, your Believe program is going to continue on. So if anyone is in that region of Bogalusa, Covington areas, you know, just tell us about what you have coming up so people can know and how to find out about, you know, if they want to get their kids involved or have the community get involved in any way. Oh, sure. So uh, we're doing three camps with Believe. One is in Bogalusa. We're doing one week starting July 5th. 
The following week, we will head to Gallman, Mississippi, which is Kapaya County. We'll do a week there, and then we'll wrap up in Slidell uh, for a week there. And if you're interested, go to believecamp.com, uh, believecamp.com, and you can find out more information about us, and you can register online. It's uh, a really cool experience, and uh, like I mentioned before, uh, oh, actually, every year we do a different theme, and this year's theme is Around the World in 80 Minutes. So it's kind of a takeoff on the old huh. book and play and movie Around the World in 80 Days. Um, yeah. So in we're going to do an 80 minute production at the end of the week, and it's going to be traveling around the world. And all of our instructors, all of our directors, as I mentioned, they've also performed and traveled around the world and continue to do so. Mm-hmm. And so we're all going to be sharing our experiences with them and giving them a, a taste and flavor and seeing how we all still connect, even though we're from these different places. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's an awesome project, man. Awesome project. So, hey, if you listen to the podcast, and I'm sure Bruce will be open to bringing Believe to a city near you, if he can fit it into his schedule. <laughs> He's got Absolutely. so much going on. You know, <laughs> well, can I just throw this in, too? I'm glad that you said that, because um, we've been growing organically, and usually it's been people reaching out to us. I just, this morning, I heard from a young lady who actually worked with me with Believe the first two years that we did it. And she's okay. now living in Texas. And so she said, I'm working on bringing you guys there next next summer. She said, I was hoping to do it this nice. summer, but it's going to take her a little longer, but she's going to bring us there next summer. And back in December, we had an opportunity. We were invited by a company in, in Southern California called, um, oh, what are they called? I just forgot. Uh, anyway, doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, a, it's a company yeah. that produced, uh, they basically manage... Uh, wellness and uh, mental and emotional wellness for families Mm. with different school districts. So they have all of these therapists and educators that are on their staff in in different school districts throughout Southern California. And so they had an in-service that they do annually, and this was their winter in-service. And they invited my team to come out and work with their teachers and and therapists. And so we did a one-day session with them, and it it was incredible. And it was everything I always believed about believe and the whole unity idea is that yeah. it can translate to adults as well. And uh, when it was all said and done, the feedback that we got was that their staff unanimously said that what we provided with believe was their favorite and most impactful part of their in service was was wow. working with us. And so. Incredible, man. Um, yeah, I, I just uh, Glo- Golden Triad. That's it. That's the company. Golden Triad. <laughs> Got yeah. it. Yeah, so. Give Golden Triad a shout out for for, for, <laughs> yeah. for allowing Believe to come come in and the Unity Unity product to come in and make a difference. That's great, man. So you know, again, been an incredible interview, man. Um, so much to share. You've had such an again an extraordinary life, and thank you for coming on and sharing that with us. Um, I really acknowledge you yeah. for the work you're doing in in making you know, conversations come together because like we talked about earlier off camera, you know, at the end of the day, when you really start to get to know people, you know, we're human beings and we're pretty complex, but we're actually not that complicated. You know, we all want pretty much the same thing. People want a good quality of life. Uh, People want to be able to raise their kids in a safe, clean space, right? No one wants to live in the hood and in the ghetto, you know, and I have this conversation with people constantly. It's like no one has to grow up in those kinds of conditions, right? And so people like you, Bruce, who go into these types of areas that are underserved and showing these kids that it's possible that you can actually get out of here. You don't have to stay, right? There's options, there's right. choices. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. Right. And right. it's possible, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you so much for uh, giving well, great, me this man. opportunity. Yeah. My pleasure, man. My pleasure. So, hey, let's uh, let's 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 check in maybe you know sometime next year and see if there's a, a follow up conversation to see how things are going with uh, with the Young American productions that you're doing and also with uh, with the Believe Project and the Unity Project. And uh, hey, man, if you want to have me on the panel to come in and be a part of those conversations, because that's right up my alley. Send me out an invitation. I'll be there. You got it. I would love that, man. Thank you very much. All right, brother. Hey, take care of yourself, man. I love you. And I will talk to you soon. All right. Peace, man. This is Doris Brown's baby boy. We out. <laughs>